Cuando fui creciendo. When I was growing up, I used to get very tired doing exercise. I used to get very tired walking. And I asked people to constantly carry me in their arms because I got so tired walking. My mother took me to doctors and doctors and doctors, but none of them could give her an answer. They told her I was a lazy girl, and that's that. No, they didn't give her any other explanation. The uncertainty until arriving at the diagnosis is one of the biggest worries for a person affecting with rare diseases. On many occasions, the achievement of a correct diagnosis produces a strong impact in the patients and their families after so many years of visiting doctor after doctor. McCardell disease, or glycogen storage disease type 5, is the result of a deficiency in one of the enzymes responsible for the metabolism of glycogen in the body. Individuals with this disease lack or produce very small concentrations of myophosphorylase or glycogen phosphorylase enzyme. A mutation in the gene responsible for the production of this enzyme can cause the deficiency. McCardell disease is a metabolic and recessive genetic disease, which means that you have it, one inherits one copy of the mutated gene from each of the parents. The gene of phosphorylase PYGM, the muscle type of the glycogen phosphorylase gene, is located in chromosome 11Q13. This gene is responsible for the synthesis of the myphosphorylase or glycogen phosphorylase enzyme. To date, almost 100 different mutations have been identified. McCardell disease shows itself only and exclusively as a myopathy. It is the most common form of muscular glycogenosis. It does not affect the isoforms of the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase in the myocardium, liver or brain. The myophosphorylase is an essential enzyme to obtain energy and its deficiency affects primarily the capacity of the skeletal muscle to perform physical exercises. There are two mechanisms that explain the intolerance to exercise associated with this disease. On one side, the deficit of myphosphorylase stops the organism of the substrate needed for the anaerobic glycolysis necessary for the initial phase of muscle contraction. Additionally, the impossibility to metabolize glycogen aerobically induces its deposit inside cells, inside the fibers of its shredded muscle. The persistent weakness in the patients is a consequence of the permanent muscular damage and the subsequent loss of muscular fibers. In muscular biopsies sustained with hematoxylin and eosin, multiple clear vacuoles are observed with glandular eosinophil content and susarcolemic location. PAS, periodic acid shift staining, allow us to demonstrate the presence of granular deposit, PAS positive for glycogen, inside the vacuoles. And with a histochemical study, we can demonstrate also the absence of the myophosphorylase enzyme. I was feeling that I was not, not like the other children. I mean, I could not play tag with them, I could not run like them, I was the first one to get tired. I was already seeing myself different. I was diagnosed when I was 21 years old. What would people tell you before? Before, people would tell me that it was laziness, that I was lazy, that I was not in shape, that I wasn't doing exercise, that I had to get in shape. So, then everything was a mental problem of laziness. From here. From an assistant point of view, the clinical diagnosis is very important. The prognosis, the treatment and the prevention of possible complications are going to depend on it. Even the future healthcare coverage for this disease. It is estimated that the average age for the diagnosis of people affected with myocardial disease in Spain is around 35 years. 
Therefore, with the presentations of movies like this, we're trying to contribute to an earlier identification of these patients. The symptoms usually start in childhood, but the diagnosis is often done during the second or third decade of their lives, because many of the clinical signs, such as cramps and myoglobinuria, don't show or start before 10 years of age. From all the pediatricians that you visited, none of them diagnosed you correctly? They never were able to tell my mother what I had, or anything similar. And how did they get the diagnosis then? Who did the diagnosis? The first diagnosis? Well, the diagnosis began when I started feeling really, really bad, very, very tired. I came to a point where I was walking in the street and I would faint. I would lose all strength and fall down. I am referring to when I was 18 or 19 years old. After that time, the symptoms became worse, with muscular contractors painful cramps, exhaustion, fatigue. Didn't the doctors run any analytical tests to see what you had? No. Didn't they ever think about that possibility? No. The protocol for diagnosis starts with criteria of clinical inclusion, intolerance to exercise. The symptoms usually start during the first half of childhood. However, it can be difficult to distinguish those symptoms from behaviors related to a normal childhood, and the diagnosis often will not be given until the person is 20 or even 30 years old. The first test they did was an analysis of CK, and the values were very, very high. Then they told me that it was a problem with the muscle, and they continued in that direction with that clue. They started to look and finally, when I was 21 years old, I was diagnosed with myocardial disease. Indeed, the levels of CK, creatine kinase, give very important information, considering that 90% of the patients with myocardial disease present elevated levels of this enzyme in the serum in a persistent way, with values oscillating around 1000 IUL at rest a may increase to 35,000 IUL or more with muscle excession, while the reference value for this enzyme is less than 170 IUL in a person without DSDV. The ischemic forearm exercise test will give us a flattening in the curve of the lactic acid. This test consists of stimulating muscular glycolysis to maximum during ischemic forearm exercise determining the levels of lactate, lactic acid, and ammonium produced. The ammonium would serve as control in this test. A catheter is inserted in the anticubital vein and the first blood sample is taken in basal conditions. Next, a blood pressure cuff is situated in the patient's forearm, bringing its blood pressure above the patient's to block blood flow to the exercising hand. At this point, the patient starts to perform arm exercises, opening and closing the hand of the arm where the finger manometer is, for one minute. After the exercise, samples of blood are taken to measure lactate levels after 1, 3, 5 and 10 minutes. In healthy individuals, the increase of lactate is 3 to 5 times more with respect to the basal or control level. In patients with Macalda's disease, the increase in lactate is not observed, and instead, a flat curve is obtained over time, whereas the curve for ammonium will be normal or with inflated values used to detect false positives. The intolerance to exercise is characteristic with myalgias, muscle pains, muscular cramps, and muscular stiffness and contractures. The urine may present a red color due to myoglobinuria caused by the necrosis of the muscular fibers produced by the same mechanisms that originate fatigue and contractures. During the course of their lives, many of the patients end up presenting crises of myoglobinuria after intense exercise. On these occasions, the urine presents a characteristic red color due to the acute 
rhabdomyolysis as a consequence of the presence of myoglobin from the degraded muscles in the urine. This situation should also be considered as a warning sign for acute renal failure. It is also characteristic to present a second wind phenomenon or a partial recovery from the intolerance after a few minutes, which means that if the patient rests briefly when the myalgia and the contractions begin, adaptation phase, he or she can continue to exercise for a longer period of time, second wind phase. Since the diagnosis of your disease when you were 21 years old, how has your life been? Well, my crisis now, what I feel when I have a crisis is a contraction of the muscles and sometimes not even that. Sometimes I feel terribly tired without desire to do anything at all, very, very sleepy. Uh, and, and, well, I say, I end up saying that, well, I have to go to the doctor then, and, and they usually send me to the emergency room when I have a severe fixed contraction. Sometimes a simple anti-inflammatory is enough to stop the contraction, but when it's not, they send me to the hospital. And in the hospital, they do a laboratory test of CK. And of course, since it gives a high value, they diagnose me with rhabdomyolysis and they keep me in the hospital. The majority of the times I have had a crisis without any apparent reason without knowing why. Sometimes I get a contraction in a leg, in an arm, maybe when sitting wrong, sleeping, things like that. For example, last time I had a crisis because I was doing too many things. What will you tell us? What will you tell to the doctors that, like me, work in a healthcare center, who work as family doctors and that very occasionally see a patient with a disease we call rare, a disease we not, might not be aware of, don't we know how to identify them? With your experience, what will you tell us so that we will be a bit more aware of the diagnosis of these rare diseases? I know you have to rule out things or diseases more, more common. But if someone comes telling you that he or she is very tired every day, with very painful muscle cramps and feels very weak and this and that. Well, instead of leaving her and tell her that is nothing, it will go away. With some multivitamins, it will go away. I think you should pay more attention. An, an analysis of CK is not that hard to do. I want to thank ASEM, because when I discovered ASEM Galicia, I was totally psychologically down. And ASEM held me too, while well, uh, they put me in contact with a very good psychologist. And after three years of psychological therapy, my self-esteem has improved. I learned to be more independent to live my life calmly, to be able to say what I want without being afraid. And all of this helped me so much in my life. And then, well, I also want to thank Nelly. Without her, this wouldn't be possible.